This week on CrossFeed. Praying for flooding. Does religious freedom extend to the hospital? Get that autistic kid out of this church now. The true story of the candy cane? Phantom people, phantom churches. Hello, everyone, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, Pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa. I am Pastor Jim Butler, Pastor of St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts, and it's good to have everybody here and to be back. Wow, we're on Thursday night again, two yeah. weeks in a row? Man, we should get a raise. Ah, uh, really. I'll double, I'll, we'll double our salaries. <laughs> good. <laughs> Well, I just got back from vacation, so that was nice. I had a good time. Took I'm kids to the did. zoo and all kinds of stuff. Good. I'm glad. I uh, was just telling Dale that I am celebrating our. This is this is how I celebrate my wedding anniversary. So uh, as of today, I've been married 26 years. So. Yep. I imagine it is quite surprising that someone would put up with me for 26 years, but, but she has. <laughs> Even when he podcasts on his anniversary. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> what can I tell you? Just a real romantic. <laughs> so uh, that's part of life. But uh, where should we begin tonight? Well, you know what? It is uh, behind me, even though it's getting kind of dark out. Um, it is raining out there. And so let's talk about focus on the family and Barack Obama. That sounds like a good guy. A good, good, good one. Uh, let's try. There he is. That's Stuart Shepard. He's the guy who, who, who made this request. Oh, I forgot to check YouTube for the video. If I can find it, I'll stick it at the end of the show. Okay. Uh, but yeah, uh, now he says it was a joke, but, uh, this guy, uh, Stuart Shepard, part of uh, Focus on the Family, um, had a note on the other thing asking for people to pray for abundant torrential downpours to, uh, flood and flood out Denver and to silence, uh, Barack Obama, uh, next week. Actually, I think it will be just next Thursday night, uh, when he makes his, um, presidential acceptance speech uh for some reason having 22,000 people in an indoor stadium wasn't big enough for him so he wanted to go to an outdoor stadium and have 75,000 people <laughs> says would it be wrong to ask people to pray for rain of biblical proportions And he asked for the and rain. The answer to, start to that question start. is yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, we should not be asking God to curse people. Okay. Uh, that would be wrong. So now they, they pulled it down, what, uh, 24 hours after it was posted. And uh, he says that it was intended to be mildly humorous. Your heat has made you powerful. Isn't Focus on the Family supposed to be a Christian organization? Yeah. This was not humorous. This was not funny. This was... And it's interesting how many Focus on the Family supporters told them, take it down. I mean, it wasn't just, you know, people who would, I think, were necessarily or would support... Barack Obama, but some of their own supporters said this this is tacky. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So no, I mean, granted, Jim and I, you know, we say all kinds of of goofy things, and uh, you know, we make jokes and stuff. But I don't think we've ever called people to do something really nasty to anybody, and we kind of make a point of not doing that. Um. And and even if we have, it's been, you know, immediately clarified, this is just a joke, I'm kidding, you know, don't do that. Whereas this, while he may have been 
you know, smiling or something. Um, I, you know, I, I'm sure that the people of Denver <laughs> would really appreciate this. Well, now, I used to live in Denver. That's where I did my, my vicarage. Okay? I was actually in Lakewood, Colorado, which, uh, as a Concordia Lutheran Church, we sat on a foothill. We could overlook all of Denver from, from there. Our church was a bit of a lover's lane because you could see all the city lights at night and stuff. <laughs> but uh, I caught a few couples making out up there. But anyway, um, when I was there, um, we had one of the worst hailstorms that Denver had ever seen. Um, people, you know, had the metal sheds in their backyards, and they said those were just ripped to shreds. Uh, everybody and the brother was getting a new roof. Um, now our car was fine, but, uh, our DCE's car had, uh, um, little pock marks all over it from the hail. Hmm. One of our members had a broken arm, a uh, big old hailstorm the size of a grapefruit broke through his windshield and then broke his arm. So, uh, outside our house, I measured it and the hail was over a foot deep. Wow. I mean, it was just, it was just a hailstorm of, you know, the, the, the hailstorm of 1984 and anybody in Denver would remember it. But the, the, but when they were at Denver, they get a storm almost every afternoon around three o'clock. It rains. Um, and so, yeah, you know, the, this idea of getting a, a huge storm like, like that could actually happen in Denver. You know, I, I was there through one of them. It really can happen. Um, and they often get hailstorms in the afternoon. Or, now, this is another, the other one, of course, famous one for, for me in Denver, was the 1985 Youth Gathering. And the, no, not 85, 89, 89. Yeah, I was there. Youth okay. Gathering. And the, the famous Red Rock Sample Rock Theater. Store. Yes. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I was, you there. I was there. The storm. Yep. Okay, you, yep. you and me both. You are probably a teen. I, yeah, I was a youth. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I was a pastor. God, I'm so old. Anyway, yep. um, <laughs> thank you. But, uh, yeah, so, I mean, that's the other famous one, of course, for us Lutherans is, uh, for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, uh, Red Rocks is an amphitheater, and um, there was a storm that came in off the mountains. We could really watch the storm come in during this concert that we were at. I mean, now, if again, if you're in Denver, you expect to get wet at Red, Ro- Red Rocks because it rains, you know, it just does. But this was not a rain. This was a storm. And uh, Red Rocks is made to f- drain very quickly in the rain. Well, there's another word for that, flash flooding. Mm-hmm. And so then it was compounded because they were supposed to have these school buses pick us up, but some guy had had a mild heart attack, and they brought in Flight for Life to fly him out of there, and that couldn't leave. And so all these school buses were stuck and to what, one, two in the morning? I don't and of course, know. I just remember sitting there. And there was this freeze yeah. coming off this mountain, and we yep. were all freezing yep. it out up there. Yep. yep. Yep, I I just remember, uh, well, I remember it getting cold, and it started to rain, and we're all sitting there, and we're getting cold, and they keep going on with this concert. And then the wind shifted so that the the, the covering of the amphitheater, uh, all of a sudden the wind shifted so it was blowing toward the band. And then they decided it was time to stop because the band was getting wet. <laughs> And, you know, when you're using electrical instruments. <laughs> oh, well, that's when it really started coming down. Again, if you're in Red Rocks, going out there, it starts showering on you. That is nothing new. I mean, it's, it happens all the time up there. But anyway, but going back to past our story here, um, back to back to back to uh, uh, Barry um, and doing his acceptance speech. Uh, it could come into a terrible storm out there. It, it, it would not be unusual for Denver, but we really don't hope for it, and we certainly, certainly shouldn't be praying for it to happen. But it would give new meaning to hail to the chief. That's true. <laughs> on that note, it is time for us to move on. Um, <laughs> hang on here. For some reason, we have a problem behind me, and I'm going to see if I can get this to be reset. We interrupt your regular broadcast to bring you this important news bulletin. There we are. That looks better. Uh, where should we go? Boy, I think we can only go uphill from here, so. That's for sure. 
Um, I don't have a good transition. You know what? Do you think they'll give away candy canes? There you go. Yeah, maybe they'll give away candy canes. Um, and that's a horrible transition, but oh well. <laughs> some some nights we got it, and some nights we don't. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, this is a, a, a I don't know. It's one of these things that got to be a a, a huge thing again. That I don't know. I just wonder sometimes if anybody has any common sense. This is this this kind of two things here is the whole thing is kind of goofy um first of all it was this was something that happened in 2003 uh joel curry who was 11 at the time made candy cane style christmas ornaments with a note that school officials considered religious literature um this was that you've probably all seen it the meaning of the candy cane which I love this. Refer to Jesus six times and God twice. <laughs> they oh, <counted>. no. <laughs> this sort of like when they watch the, these like really profane movies and they go, "Well, there were you know thirty seven instances of nudity and and this swear word was said this many times. This swear word was said this many times." It's like, um, if you don't think Christians right. should be watching this, why were you? <laughs> Now, th- th- there's a classroom project. The, the students, it sounds like a junior achievement here. Uh, the students were to develop and sell products. And so he developed these, these Christmas, uh, ornaments, uh, with the, so, you know, story about the, the candy cane. And, um, <clears throat> then, uh, he received an A on the, on the assignment, but then he was told he had to remove the Christian message. Um, and so they sued against the Saginaw School District, um, arguing, you know, basically he's got a freedom of religion here. He's got the right to do what he wants to. A federal judge ruled in favor of the boy. A three-panel judge for the Sixth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals uh, uh, went against him. Um, and now uh, they are going against him again. They're peti- now they're petitioning the Supreme Court to hear this case as well as asking for all their legal fees back, too. Um, you know, once again, you know, this is... Would any reasonable person see this as being an official expression of the school? Well, yeah, this is a kid's project. I mean, this is, yeah, this is this is the kid's project. This is what, you know, you know, whatever, uh, uh, um, this, this kid is doing. Joel Curry. So this is Joel's thing. Um, you know, common sense says, let them do it. Yeah. Next thing you know, they're going to be throwing kids in jail for walking around school saying Merry Christmas. That's hate speech. <laughs> so. And with, with with you, it might be. I don't know. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, I, I, again, realizing that religious neutrality is religious neutrality. So if some kid put out a, a thing with a Wiccan symbol on it, how would we feel? You know, what would we think? You know, was that okay? I wouldn't have a problem with it if it was his personal project. Now, you know, if you have a teacher, like I had when I was in high school, I had a teacher that would go, you're all gods, and we'd meditate in class and all kinds of stuff like that. That I have a problem with. Because then it's the teacher um, uh, giving out religious doctrine and and um encouraging didn't require anybody to do it but encouraging students to be involved in uh you know particular religious practice going on in the classroom um whereas here this is just it's a kid's project and it's not it's not that the the school was expressing anything it was a kid expressing it. and that's the difference the cool the school cannot express any kind of religious preference but it can't prevent students from doing it. Now, 
There's another part of this, though. We can't talk about this story without talking about the fact that that thing you see all over the place the, about the story of the candy cane that he used on this is not true. <laughs> it's if, if this were uh, uh, a history class, then they could have a problem with it because it's not historically accurate. <laughs> right. But, uh, yeah, that's from a, a Snopes article. Uh, uh, anybody does not know to go to Snopes.com, you should know to go to that. Yes. And, um, you know, they, they go through the whole thing and say, basically, this is, this is not it. <laughs> this is not the story. They didn't come across. It's a cane. It's not supposed to be the, the, the letter G, uh, J for Jesus. Um, yeah, and they were originally white. In fact, they were white up until fairly recently. So, and and they were invented over in Europe. the 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 only religious aspect of them is they were invented by a, a pastor or a priest um, that was trying to keep the kids quiet during the Christmas program. <laughs> like, here, have some candy. <laughs> Be quiet. So, and I think that they were originally just sticks, too. So, you know, this is, this is one of those things that, um, that when Christians start passing this stuff out and, you know, Christian bookstores, which is where this kid got it, he copied it off of a, something he saw in a Christian bookstore. Um, you know, Christians start passing this misinformation around and, well, if you can't get that history right. You know, how do you know that your history of about Jesus and the resurrection is right? You know, it, it destroys our credibility. <laughs> there was a, a one comment on this story at CrossfeedNews.com um, that was pointing out the um, the, the historical inaccuracy. Um, whoever it was kind of mean, though, because he said, I hope the kid got an F. Well, he obviously didn't read the story because the kid got an A. But... Um, so, yeah, I would, the, the story of the, of the candy cane, I think it, that you can use it as a, um, as a sermon illustration. I wouldn't say that there was this guy in Indiana, but I would say, you know, there's, you can look at a candy cane and you can, you know, you can say, does this remind you of, of something? But, you know, and you can assign, and and Christians have historically taken, uh, sort of, uh, non-religious things or not, or, or non-Christian things and given them Christian or religious significance. Like Christmas. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yes. The Yule festival, you know, (laughs) a lot of Christians have Yule logs, which that always kind of, um, catches my attention. Because Yule is the pagan festival, and burning a Yule log is part of that pagan festival. Or, um, you know, the, you hear Yuletide, as in, like in Deck the Halls. Deck the Halls is not a Christmas song. It's a Yule song. I did not know that. So. Yep. That is true, but, uh, you know... Mm-hmm. But what if we had a Christmas service and we had a disruptive person? Would we throw the person out? And uh, this is a story. I have a member of my church who is Asperger's, which is related to um, it's a mild uh, form. autism. Yeah, a mild mm-hmm. form of autism. And, by the way, the town I live in, Randolph, uh, <coughs> actually has one of the big, the oldest schools for autistic uh, children in the country, Boston Hitachi Hitachi School, the name of it. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, so this this story really hit me because, you know, what do you do in a situation like this? I, I I thought it was an interesting thing, but let's give the 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 the. Uh, there's a, a Adam race, and Adam in the picture is the boy sitting there in the wheelchair, and he is autistic. His parents are Roman Catholic, and they were going to well, worship um, in birth in Minnesota. 
And he's autistic, and the priest said Adam spit, wet his pants, and made loud noises and nearly ran over people while bolting from the church after services. And so he basically told the family, you cannot bring him in here acting like that. You cannot bring your son to church. He's disrupting everybody else's attempt to worship. Um, and then it was, uh, I guess they actually brought suit against against the church and the um uh, uh, uh um it was upheld by the court that yes he had to maybe i'm wrong about that maybe i've got that part wrong yeah i think uh, you're right yeah they upheld the restraining order barring him from the services so mm-hmm. yeah it actually did they got a restraining order against him from coming in um and it made quite a few of but my goodness, what do you do? How do you, how would you handle a situation like this, Dale? You know, that's a good question. I think I would definitely want to talk to the parents and say, or I guess the mom in this case, um, and, but, and, you know, and, and talk about the situation. And it sounds like they did try to talk about it. And, um, and mom says that the, uh, these reports are exaggerated. Um, but, you know, I think that there needs to be a happy medium here. I would never throw somebody out of church unless they were just coming for the, for the sole purpose of disrupting things. And even then I'd rather, you know, at that point talk to them and, and, uh, but you know, in this case, he's got autism. He can't help it, but he still needs to hear about Jesus. And, um, and he still needs to be, have it communicated to him that God loves him, that he is mm-hmm. as much a part of the church as anybody else. Why do you lay these troubles on an already troubled mind? But how disruptive can you allow someone to be? I mean, cause they, they, they talk about some other stories in here. Um, uh, you know, a California man was kicked out of a health club for screaming. A North Carolina boy was taken off a plane before takeoff after having a meltdown. Um, a Southern Cal- South Carolina girl was ordered out of a restaurant for, uh, for crying. Um, you know, you, 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 uh, and some, some kids, of course, are just, um, I mean, you know, have, have bitten, have actually chewed through their, their uh, cheek or they start banging their head against the wall. I mean, how, how, I mean, in our case, it's a mild form of, of autism. And, uh, the kid in our church, you know, he, he will get up and just start, leave, start walking around on the, the sermon and generally often get up and leave. You know, and it's not really disruptive. But how, how far can you let the, something like this go? I mean, to what, what, when do you say this is, other people are trying to pray here and your kid is sitting there being very disruptive? Well, you know, when we have little babies in church that can't control their behavior, you you give them a little time or, you know, you try to calm them down. If that doesn't work, you take them out for a little while until they calm down. And then once they're calmed down, you can bring them back in. And that's, you know, that's pretty standard practice across churches. And I would think that the same could be done here. That, all right, if, if your child, um, you know, is, is having, not because they're a baby, but because they have some sort of, um, you know, disorder that is, uh, making them unable to control their, uh, actions or behaviors, then, okay, well, you know, usually these things sort of kind of pop up and then after a while things settle down and then they're okay again. And so, okay, well, then if if this starts to get out of control, take them out. And I'm assuming that, you know, parents are able to control their kids uh, as far as, you know, take them where they need to be taken at least. Um, and if, if you know, especially we, we have a, a example in here of an 18-year-old, you know, if they're kind of strong, maybe you need a couple friends to, to help you out, you know. Maybe some sort of um uh restraint you know like they've got those um 
those harnesses that you see people walking around the mall sometimes. It's like a leash for kids. And it's, it doesn't go around their neck. It goes around their, their chest. And maybe something like that so that that's, and you have the, the other end of the leash around your wrist or something so that if they all of a sudden get up and want to take off running, you've got them and, and you can hold them back. And then, you know. Yeah, but a, a couple hundred pound 13 year old, you're not going to hold them, leash them back very easily. Well, um, although, you know, there's other ways you can adjust too. It's interesting. At the end of the story, it talked about, um, uh, an 18-year-old named Walter Boyles, and she started attending her first Reformed chicken church in New Jersey. And um, you know, he was afraid he would because he, he didn't bring she didn't bring her son uh, along because uh, uh, you know other church would run up and down the aisle screeching. And the, the pastor uh, Susan Kramer Mills said, "So what? Bring him anyway." And one of the things they did was they revised their services. Uh, she said it used to start slowly and build to a crescendo. Now it starts with with uh, more noise, um, and that helps them emotionally to yeah to helps cope. them to cope and things for some reason. But again, you know, when you're in a Catholic church with a highly structured liturgy, you can't really do that. No, but you know, there's but, so many different yeah. options. It might be you know a lot of churches have like a, a they call it like a cry room or a mother's room or something like that. Where, um, where there's like a window in the back of the sanctuary, or maybe you have glass doors, um, on the, the back of the sanctuary and then speakers. So you could actually sit in the, in the narthex, the, the sort of lobby in the back and still be, you know, have a little bit of soundproofing in between and still be able to see what's going on, to hear what's going on and still, you know, still be there. Still be a part of it. Yep. You know, there's there's options here. You know, maybe it's going to require, if this is a family that wants to be in church on a regular basis, maybe it's going to require a little bit of work to, um, you know, maybe there's a, the church, if the doors between the narthex and the sanctuary are wooden, say, maybe it's going to require the church to buy new doors and put in some glass doors. Um, so that you can make this possible if it's not, because like at our church, we've got wooden doors, so that wouldn't really work. Although we also have a, a sort of glass window, uh, uh, mother's room in the back. And so, you know, we have that option. So and that would work. Or, or, you know what you could do? Another option would be and very cheaply actually anymore. Um, Buy a get a video camera, run a wire to a TV set out your uh, out to another room mm -hmm. where they could watch it. Mm -hmm. Full circuit. circuit TV. Well, we've done that for funerals where we had more people there than we had mm -hmm. seats for, um, and we have too. So it, it would work. I mean, you could do something like that. Yeah, worst case scenario. Yeah, but I think. Yeah. What we're basically saying is there should be other options here other than telling the family you can't bring your kid to church. Right. And, uh, you know, and because, you know, the child's name is Adam, and, and Adam needs to know the gospel. <laughs> because uh, his, his namesake messed it up. Uh, Adam's living with the result of that sin. Uh, and uh, But he needs to know there's a second Adam who redeemed him who loves him, who died for him, and one day he's going to rise again and he's going to be completely healed. Yeah. Yeah. And the family mm -hmm. needs to hear that message too. Mm -hmm. You know, that that even an incurable uh, disease, God has a cure and he will give it to us when the time is right. Oh, very nice, Blaine. The cure of the resurrection. Yeah. So, well, we pray for the, do pray for this church and, and pray for um, everyone involved in this situation. Yeah. But what if the church didn't really exist? Don't ruin a fantasy, okay? This is, this is really bizarre. I had to get about halfway through the story to really understand what was going on. Um, we have a, uh, Pastor says he was defamed in a scandal involving allegations of phantom churches in the Rio Grande Valley. 
and he sued the Baptist General Convention of Texas for libel and slander. His name is Otto Arango. And that, that's, that's him behind me. That's Otto. And uh, basically, he and a couple other pastors uh, claim that they started 258 new Rio Grande Valley churches, which received about $1.3 million from the denomination. That's a from lot of new churches in one area. Baptist General Conven- Convention. Um. And uh, so they did an investigation to see whether these churches actually exist. And they included there's they concluded there's only about five to ten of them, <laughs> as opposed to two hundred and fifty eight. <laughs> and but now he is saying that oh they they did exist. Um, he's lost money because people don't trust him now. Um, he has past. I, I, I love this. Is there's past and future mental anguish. Uh, so <laughs> mental anguish to yet to come. Uh, it's the now and the not yet. <laughs> all right, that's right. Yeah, the now and the not yet here, and uh, so he wants. Uh, he wants his money. So he's suing. He doesn't say how much he's suing for. No. I suppose... Oh, yeah, here. Oh, no. No, that's not it. So, (laughs) I think if this guy's going to sue, he first needs to... If if he claims that all these churches exist, or, or even if they did in the past, 258 of them, there ought to be some records somewhere. If he's receiving money from the denomination... He better have accountability for that. And if he doesn't, then uh, he should be happy that he hasn't been thrown in jail for embezzlement. Right, yeah, that's what gets me. The report lacked, the, the report cited lacks oversight on the part of the Baptist General Convention of Texas. Now, I said on the board of directors of the New England District and the Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate, if we had something, if we we lost $1.3 million, they'd be calling from my head. I mean, you know, what the heck are people on the board director doing? Um, you know, I mean, it'd be all over us. And you're right. This guy's probably... They, I will, and the second question would have been, why didn't you press charges? Yeah. You know, I mean, you, you know, if he, if he embezzled, you know, that kind of cash, he should be, you know, in jail. I, um, because otherwise, he's going to do it again. Mm-hmm. Yes, he, kind of he will do it again. So, you know, if if his claims are true, that he didn't actually do this, you know, all you got to do is audit the books. If he doesn't have the books to back it up, then, you know, there ought to be, you know, if he had 258 churches, let's uh, let, let's pull up some witnesses for him, like good... 500 witnesses, that's only like two per church to say, yeah, we used to have this church. So this really, it's, I'm sorry, but 258 churches, it shouldn't be that tough to prove that some of these things existed at some point. You know, even if we're talking about like these uh, cell churches or some, you know, the real small kind of deals. If he was pulling this kind of money, this wasn't just a bunch of people getting together over coffee and um, and and doing a Bible study together. Right. So, you know, the thing that, that bothers me the most about this is the comments on the page. You know? Yeah, they're just really vile, aren't they? Well, you know, the thing is, and I, I just, I printed off the first page for reference on this, and uh, the third comment down, as I'm looking at it at this point, is typical Christians, LMAO, right? This is the biggest problem. The biggest problem with this story is not that this guy stole all this money, if that's the case, right? The problem here is that it makes Christians look bad, and therefore it makes Christ look bad. 
And, you know, people see this stuff and they say, if that's what Christians are like, I don't want to have anything to do with them. You know, and, and we've talked about that before. You know, people don't realize the drastic impact of sin. It doesn't just affect you. It doesn't just affect the person that you sin against. There's far-reaching consequences. You know, we talked about Adam, you know, the first Adam. And look at, look, all they did is eat a piece of fruit, right? Oh, what happened, though? The entire creation was thrown out of whack. I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. And, um... Yep. So, you know, so this stuff, when when you do this, you affect other people, no matter what your sin. And that's why we need God's forgiveness so much. And that's why we're so thankful that he gave it to us in Christ. I seem to have a thing for sinners. Well, I seem to have a thing for sinning. Check, please. So, but... I don't know what else you can say. It gets yeah. a little bit... I don't have a good transition. Well, I can't think of one either, but uh, let's go off then to Last California. Story. Which... This one really frustrates me. So the California Supreme Court ruled unanimously, I might add, that... Um, uh, and by the way, this story is interesting because Dale and I both both submitted it. So, uh, but uh, he did it first, so we have to use his. Uh, that doctors cannot use their religious beliefs to deny treatment to same-sex couples. And in this case, it was uh, this was a, a, two, a lesbian couple who were suing two doctors at a North Side North County clinic because they would not perform artificial insemination because their Christian beliefs prevented them from impregnating a, a lesbian. Um, now we've talked about similar stories in the past and this right. just points out that when it comes down to now this the really interesting thing here is that we're talking about a constitutional right to freedom of religion versus freedom of sexual preference which is not in the constitution and the part that's not in the Constitution won out over the part that's in the Constitution. We're in trouble. And that has happened many times in the past. I don't understand when you're talking about a Supreme Court, which, you know, the California Supreme Court, which their job is to interpret the Constitution. I don't know where they're getting this stuff. My problem is this is a purely elective procedure. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this is not an emergency room visit. No. This is not a heart problem. I mean, this is a decision um, to have a child, which is fine. I have no problem with them wanting to have a child. But why should these two doctors, and if one of them was already pregnant and about to give birth, I mean, and, and you know, he's the guy on call, and he should have, you know, he deliver the child. I mean, that's, that's an emergency right. situation. Right. This is not an emergency situation. Uh, there are Okay, so these two guys don't want to do it. Uh, there are other people who will do it. But matter of fact, it said that what they did was they did all the preliminary work and then told them how to go about it and yeah. gave them what they needed to do it. You know, they just could not, in good conscience, carry it out. Hey, man, this don't feel right. Um, My donkey senses are tingling all over. So. This, and, you know, they're... Going, they're overwhelmed with the decision. It's been a. I'm just so happy and so glad. Uh, it's been a long time coming. Um, so as the court clearly announced that discrimination has no place in the doctor's office, <laughs> except religious discrimination. Don't get technical with me. So they weren't discriminating. 
right? They were exercising their religious beliefs, and they weren't preventing anybody from doing anything. They were just saying, I'm right. not going to do it. Right. And, you know, what's interesting, he says, this is uh, a doctor from a different practice eventually treated. She became pregnant, giving birth to a son, Gabriel. She's also since given birth to twin girls. So right there, it's very obvious, you know, they found someone else. It, You know, why... Why do we have to force person X who says, I can't in good conscience do this? Well, if you don't, you're going to lose your license. From doing something in good conscience he feels guilty doing. When person Y is perfectly willing to do it. So yeah. long as the Dr. X is willing to say, Dr. Y can do this. I can't. I'm sorry. Yeah. Now, the only way that I would see this... And, and even maybe not this, but uh, what I would say is if there's somebody who's not willing to, to perform this, where I would say they need to be consistent because, I mean, these guys are Christians and they need to be consistent with their uh, Christian beliefs. And so that if a heterosexual couple came in and were not married, I would say you also need to now, and this is more from a religious standpoint, not from a legal standpoint, but, um, but I would say, you know, yeah, tell them you can't do it, but also tell the unmarried heterosexual couple that you can't do it. Right. No, we're not homosexual, but we are willing to learn. So, you know, let's be consistent. And you, you know, long time listeners have heard me talk about this before that all sexual sins are fall under the same commandment are all equally damnable, are all equally forgivable by Christ. And um and and you can't you know you you are if if you pick out um uh, homosexuality and say that that's somehow worse than other um sexual sins then 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 you're sinning. <laughs> because then you are sinfully discriminating. And, Absolutely, and you're you're ignoring, you know, other sins that are equal, and and essentially the we same have sin. often done that the church. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, we got a comment from last week, and I do appreciate it. I don't think it was a signed comment though; it was on YouTube, and um, it was just a kind of a one sentence uh, thing. Is uh, dealing with our our. Um, our Mormon nudist story. And uh, the guy simply said, uh, got after us really, I don't want to quote it directly, but, you know, got after us for mocking Mormons. You know, just, you know, because you're anti Mormon just like the majority of your audience. And I guess that was probably directed at me uh, for a couple of my comments. First off, I, I don't think we were mocking Mormons. The same thing, we were mocking a Mormon nudist. Uh, maybe mocking nudists a little bit more than probably. Mormons. Um, however, I think it was probably especially directed at my comment that, um, uh, well, maybe he had a burning in the bosom that told him this is okay. Now, how do you tell him it's not? I, I, and what I meant by that is whenever you determine the truthfulness of your belief, by an experience, then you really can't deny what somebody else says if they also point to that same experience or a different one. Mm-hmm. That's the problem with ever going by experiences that you've had, because how do you make how do you decide this this experience is normative? This experience is what what seals it, um, as opposed to an external word. Yeah. And, you know, we, it's, it's not just Mormons. There's a, a lot of, uh, branches of the Pentecostal movement that have the same problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, so you end up with, you've got, well, God declared to me that, uh, that the, the church should be called the church of God. And you got somebody else that says, God declared to me that the church should be called the church of God in Christ. Well, which is it? Did God change his mind? You know, 
And um, so there, now I'm picking on Pentecostals, all right? But we're not trying to pick on any people. We're just pointing out an inconsistency in the belief. And if people feel that our beliefs are inconsistent, please let us know. We'd be happy to discuss them. Uh, or a, a good example is uh, now down in um, Florida. Uh, the guy in charge of the Florida outpouring uh, is getting divorced from his wife. And, you know, what if he just say, well, God told me this was okay. I had experience that, that showed this was, this was permissible. Well, no, what does God's word say? Right. And so actually right. then, you know, I mean, that's, and that would be our, our, our friend would be our, our issue then with, with, uh, you know, uh, because the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints, you know, pushes the burning of the bosom as being a, an experience that tells you what they t- say is true. Right. Um, and I've had a lot of them, a lot of Mormons tell me they've had the burning in the bosom. They, they know it's true because of that. Then how can you say, well, this isn't true or this isn't correct? Right. Because and, really I've, that, that experience is supposed to trump anything else. Yeah. And I've, I've talked to people, uh, I've talked to Mormons. I've talked to people who have had experiences, uh, talking to Mormons where they, you know, they lay out from the Bible, you know, here's where the, the Latter-day Saints teachings run contrary to God's revealed word. And, and they, the answer usually when it comes down to it is, um, is the, the trump card is, well, I've got this burning in the bosom, so it doesn't matter what you say. I know this is right. Well, I'm sorry, but you always have to go back to the Bible. And if what you believe contradicts what God says, then what you believe is wrong no matter what branch of, of religion or, or anything that you're coming with, from. So be happy if, if, uh, if that person is, is watching this as well, um, which I'm, I hope so. Uh, but, you know, we would be happy to discuss it further. All right. And by the way, neither Dale or I would consider ourselves anti-Mormon or anti-Pentecostal, or anti-anything else. We are, however, unapologetically pro-Lutheran. Yeah. So everything yeah. we look at this thing comes through a a, 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 a conservative Lutheran lens. Although and, we're not afraid to poke fun at Lutherans either. So no, if, In fact, I, I would say if there's anybody that we pick on, it's Lutherans. That's our own church body. But right. we are unapologetically, right. um, you know, Lutheran, and so we we are you know overall pro-Lutheran. So that's that's mm-hmm. really our mostly mm-hmm. our, our perspective. But again, you you got comments? We love comments, uh, and we'll talk about your comments and try to try to address them the best way we can. You can post if you're watching this on YouTube or Flickr or whatever. You can post right there in the comment section. It gets emailed to us right away. Uh, you can. Email us at podcast at crossfeednews.com. You can follow me on Twitter. If you want to, okay. Yeah, you Crossfeed can, News. Twitter, uh, uh, Dale. If you're watching this on iTunes, just click on the screen. It takes you to a comment page. By the way, please visit our website, uh, crossfeednews.com. Uh, you can post stories. It really is this great little bookmarklet thing that Dale's got there to use for uh, a Safari. Uh, I've been using it this week for the first time. It's just absolutely great. It'll work in any browser. Um, okay, so you know, really encourage you to use that. That it works wonderfully. Um, share your comments. Um, you know, we, we kind of pick the stories on what's the most popular through the click-throughs. So um, read it, mark it, inwardly digest it. <laughs> That was a Lutheran inside joke for anybody that didn't catch it. Um, uh, there was something else I was going to say. On that Lutheran remember, note, so. God bless you all. Have a good rest of the week. And uh, we will see you uh, a little bit late next week um, because uh, I've got something else going on Thursday night and so we won't be able to record, but we will record on Sunday. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Good night, everybody. God bless. Hi, 
I'm Stuart Shepard. This is Stoplight. Would it would it be would it be wrong to ask people to pray? Would it be wrong if we ask people to pray for rain? Okay, not just rain, abundant rain, torrential rain, urban and small stream flood advisory rain. Would it be wrong if we prayed for rain on, say, a particular night at, say, a particular location? No, I'd say the evening of August 28th, right here at Mile High Stadium in Denver. During the primetime TV hour, when a certain presumptive nominee is set to give a certain acceptance speech at a certain Democratic National Convention. I'm talking umbrella ain't gonna help you rain. Not flood people out of their houses rain, just good old swamp the intersections rain. We're not asking for hail to size the canned hams or lightning bolts to set the bunting on fire. Just rain. Beautiful rain. Network cameras can't see the podium rain. Attendees can't walk back to the indoor arena without wishing for hip waiters rain. I know, you might ask, why would I pray for that? Well, I'm still pro-life. And I'm still in favor of marriage being only between one man and one woman. And I like the next president, who will select justices for the U.S. Supreme Court, to agree. So I'm praying for unexpected, unanticipated, unforecasted rain that starts two minutes before the speech is set to begin. Would it be wrong to pray for rain? I don't have any special insights or special connections. I'm just an ordinary guy who's looking for people, lots of people, who feel like I do, to pray for rain. Now I know there will probably be people who will pray for 72 degrees and clear skies, but this isn't a contest. But if God decides, and it's always up to God to decide, if God decides that rain of biblical proportions would be a good and proper meteorological condition for that evening, we'll see it, and we'll say that it is good. And if he decides it's not really necessary, I'm okay with that. I'll still trust in his wisdom, and I'll rest peacefully knowing that lots of us offered up a humble prayer request. Would it be so wrong if we asked people to pray for rain?